Yeah, John Byrne is my name. So I'm currently the Smart Grid Manager for ESB Networks. And what I want to give you today is an insight into how we plan to empower our customers over the next decade through a smarter energy system. Uh, I have four main themes in my presentation that I want to cover off, OK? The first things are the drivers or the catalysts for change, what's pushing this level of change through over the next decade. What will a smarter energy system look like? That's a question I'm asked a lot. Uh, what's the difference between what we have now? Why do we need what we're moving to? And what will it look like in about a decade's time? How long will it take to get us there? There are some of the questions that I want to answer in the second part of my presentation. The third bit then is the consumer to the prosumer transition that we're currently seeing. Uh, we're at the sort of embryonic stages, if you like, of that transition now, but I'll give you some pointers and some of the technologies that uh, the prosumers will be using and how that change is gathering pace over time. And finally, uh, and I suppose the ultimate purpose of this, is how all this will benefit you, the customers, me, everyone in this room and beyond, all of our customers. And we've obviously got a rich history of serving all our customers over the past 85 or so years. So the six drivers, uh, in my opinion, the first national and EU legislation, and in particular is the EU 2020 targets. And that in itself is driving a lot of the national uh, regulation and legislation, particularly in the environmental space. Secondly, the integration of renewables. And if anyone takes a journey on any of the motorways, west, north, south, they'll pass a uh, you know, considerable number of wind farms. This is a change that's underway, and it's, it's well observed. It's well commented on throughout Irish society now. We have a natural resource. It's wind. We have another natural resource of the Atlantic Ocean off our west coast. So it's incumbent upon us, and in some sectors, uh, to do what we can to avail of these natural resources. Systems technology. Uh, and in the true smart grid space, that's uh, a big impact. Uh, currently, we have about 2,000 devices, give or take, connected to our network. Over the next decade, that will increase by a factor of six. So we push up around 13,000, 14,000 devices. And anyone familiar with networking will know that the value of a network increases with the more connected devices you have. Customer empowerment. And this is a common theme throughout the day. It's been touched on by Pat this morning, Paul just again there, um, and the Electric Ireland sort of presentation before me. We're better educated. Uh, you know, we've more data available to us. It's available in real time. Um, we know what options are out there. We're more prepared to make choices that we weren't before. Collaboration, uh, and that's, that starts with us. Um, it starts internally with better ways, finding better ways of doing what we do, what we've done since 1927, but also externally. Um, we're looking external for collaborations to bring skills, talents, capability to the business that we don't have internally, um, despite our best efforts. And finally, R&D and innovation. Uh, and I guess you only have to look around the room here to see the level of innovation that we're involved in right now. Uh, in the smart grid space, a lot of that innovation is happening in the European sector. Interestingly, it's not utility to utility collaboration, but collaboration with other parties who have nothing to do with energy traditionally. That's a very exciting space to be in. I've shown the Horizon 2020 category. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're active fishermen, shall we say, in that, in that pond. We like to try and uh, fund our innovation and our R&D where possible to try and de-risk it and to use some of the knowledge that exists throughout Europe. The fundamental component of a smart system is a resilient, robust electricity infrastructure. You can layer all the smarts, all the technologies over that system that you want, but if it is not resilient and reliable in the first instance, you're not going to have a smart system. In that context, work, I guess, on a smarter system from a group perspective uh, began in earnest maybe 10 to 15 years ago. The MV network, the medium voltage network, is the backbone of the network here. 99% of all our transformers are connected to the medium voltage system. Okay? We spent a considerable amount of money in billions refurbishing that entire system. From an energy perspective, we're converting that system from 10,000 volt to 20,000 volt operation and bringing energy efficiency to how we do our business. We spend between six and 700 million per annum doing that. These are on the networks and assets that you see overhead and also on the ones that are hidden behind walls and substations and underground. 
Um, this has not gone un unnoticed around the world. Uh, recent sort of surveys undertaken by uh, IBM uh, and others rank us as the exemplar international utility. So it's a record that we're proud of and one that we want to keep as we move forward. Our customers are happy with what we're doing also as well, and we have huge customer satisfaction rates. Uh, and I'd say some of the big six in the UK would, would struggle and really love to have these kind of, these kind of rates. So in the sentence, then, what's a smart grid? Okay. If I could give you one sentence, it's reliable, resilient infrastructure, which I've, which I've touched on, high-speed communications, and very advanced IT systems. The smart grid of the future, you know, I'd say Thomas Edison, if you look at the, at, at the grid today, would probably recognize what we're trying to do. In a decade's time, he may not. These are some of the things that a smart grid will have to take account of. Distributed generation. Okay. I've mentioned the wind already. There, are, there will be hundreds of wind farms in time. 80% uh, by number, 55% by capacity connect to the distribution system, to the 10, 20, and 30 AKV system. So where we had unilateral or uni power flows, now we've got that sort of bi-directional power flow issue. Okay. Microgeneration rapidly emerging, and I'll touch on a lot of these technologies later. Solar, wind, biohydro probably in that order, we're seeing a huge increase in the number of solar PV installations. Micro wind has been uh, sort of over the last decade and up to maybe a couple of years ago, the technology of choice, but for a lot of reasons, and particularly in an urban area, we cannot have micro wind. Uh, bio and run of the river hydro, I'm talking about the smaller hydro schemes, and you know, we're a relatively flat country with two international mountains, so there's only so much hydro we can, we can build into the system. Distributed storage, then. Uh, this is a little bit down the road, in my opinion. It is not here yet. It's, the technology is available. It's expensive. Uh, but I have a slide specifically dealing with that later, so we'll touch on that in a bit more detail. To manage this entire space, active networks are what's required. So. The historical method of connecting up a new 38 line, 110 line, 220, I'm more or less forgetting about it. Uh, that's not really going to cut it in the new, in the new age. Uh, we need to know what our networks are doing in real time. Okay? We need to have uh, better visibility and better control of our networks to cope with these additional demands. And we're going to need a lot of IT to help us there. Um, Smart charging and EVs, seen the fabulous car in the corner, no doubt. Uh, we have a fantastic charging infrastructure in Ireland now, and you can go to uh, any of the four corners of Ireland. The numbers of EVs are rising uh, in line, uh, not in line with government expectations, but they are rising nonetheless. And in time, that will form a storage body of its own. And finally then, what was touched on by Teresa uh, and Lisa in the smart home and all of the innovations taking place in the smart home. Smart metering, which is a project which has been underway for quite some time and will likely go on for another few years, and data. So with the increased number of devices, six-fold increase in the number of devices, the smart metering project, we're going to see huge amounts of data now compared to what we're used to dealing. That's a generational change for us in terms of how we protect it and how we use it. I suppose in financial analytic terms, it's modest. But for us and for any utility around the world, it's a problem that everyone is, is grappling with. The prosumer, I suppose traditionally recognized as a professional consumer, but now taken in an energy context to be a producing consumer. But we take it to be a lot more than that. A consumer who consumes electricity, who generates electricity, who stores and trades electricity. Okay. There's a lot of motivating factors for these people. Number one, the reducing technology costs. Battery technology <coughs> excuse me, has dropped off considerably. Solar PV technology has dropped off considerably. A smaller carbon footprint. As people are embarrassed about the damage that we're doing to the environment. They want to take and do something about that. And microgeneration uh, and the sort of rise of the prosumerism enables them to do that. Energy independence. These people are likely in time to consider grid defection. Okay. So they, if the installations are big enough and efficient enough, they will now consider defecting from the grid altogether. It's a phenomenon that is observed in some parts of the world, albeit at a very, very low level. People do like the comfort of that. 
but it's something we need to keep an eye on. And finally, the cost savings. They've, you know, they've pulled in all of these benefits, but there's an obvious cost saving in being able to generate yourself. I want to touch on a few of the emerging technologies uh, for a prosumer. Does anyone recognize any of these houses? Every one of these houses. <laughs> it's a bit of an ask. But if anyone recognizes any of these houses, they're all in Leinster. Okay. And we have about 14 developments in the greater Dublin area. And every single house and every single one of those developments is entirely, their roofs are entirely covered in solar PV. Double glazed windows and insulation is no longer giving you the ratings that the developers require, so they're turning to uh, renewable generation technologies to get the ratings that they desire. So if you're going to buy a house in Dublin, in the greater Dublin area, over the next two years, you have a 20% chance that you'll be a prosumer before anyone else. There's also an extensive sort of retrofit scheme. The reason being it's easy to install, there's no moving parts. It's relatively easy to maintain, and the prices are continually coming down. By 2016 or 17, the economic case for PV will be, uh, even without subsidies, will be made. There is, of course, an issue with solar PV. Okay? Um, what we've got here is the morning peak, followed by the evening peak. And that consumption profile has been with us probably over the last 80 years. People get up, use electricity, head off for work, school, whatever, and come back in the evening, when typically our evening peak uh, occurs. The peak solar occurs around lunchtime. So you've got a real problem in this orange sector. What do you do with your excess capacity? To have a swimming pool, it's a great way to heat a swimming pool. However, the two realistic options are to export it or to store it. Okay. The picture on the left is a Tesla Powerwall. So Elon Musk is a pioneer in energy development based over on the west coast of the United States. Current wealth is about 13 billion euros. He specializes in engaging in challenges that benefit humanity and mankind. Uh, he's identified uh, energy storage as an issue he'd really like to get involved in. This is, in our opinion, a truly game-changing technology because with this power wall, he's dramatically reduced the price of domestic energy storage. It's also quite an attractive box. There's not wires hanging out the side of it. You can put it on the side, beside your meter box. Everyone would acknowledge he's got experience in batteries, so there's huge scope for further, further development. So even as the prices are currently declining, efficiencies are only increasing. There's not just, though, electrical storage. We also have thermal storage. Um, and there's some real nice pieces of work being done in Ireland, and indeed ESB is part of a collaborative project with six of the other major sort of energy players in Ireland looking at thermal energy storage and how it can be used as a flexible um, aid to uh, balance, if you like, the renewable aspects and the variable as aspects of renewable generation. And again, the storage is the final piece if you want to reduce your own grid dependency. You now have uh, a lot of arrows in your quiver in terms of how you want to move your energy consumption around. So you have your consumption, you have your generation capability. If you're going to offer that in, people are going to want to know, the people who are buying that service off, you're going to know when you use electricity, how much you export, how much you import. And at that in, uh, instance, smart metering is going to become an enabler to enable you to do that trading. The smart metering project has been going on for about five to six years in earnest. It's likely to go on uh, for another number of years. The current, it's a CER project, an ESB or a major, uh, obviously stakeholder, along with board gosh and all the suppliers in that project. The target, current target is this, uh, set by the EU is that 80% of homes will have a smart meter by, by 2020. And in an Irish context, given that where we are and where that target is, that will represent one of the most ambitious rollouts of that kind of technology uh, uh, globally. It's important to realize that the smart metering is not just a like-for-like -like replacement, and there's a significant market chain system, telecoms, and data storage sort of capability that has to go with it. But what will it give us? What will it give the consumer more accuracy, more choice, <coughs> excuse me, more control? We read your meter once every two months now, on average. This will move to 48 times or every half hour per day. 
hence the increase in data, you will have more choice. So what we see in the, in the States and in other areas are actually free tariff periods, free weekends and dearer days. Easier switching from supplier to supplier because they now know exactly what your reads are in any given time. And finally, they're an enabler of microgen. If you want to put microgen in your system uh, and you want to export your capacity, you're looking for an import-export meter. The smart meter will give you that availability. And finally, more control. And that has been touched on by all the speakers today. But this really will give you improved and more personalized data options. Uh, and in doing so, that will allow you to control all of your energy costs. When we had a limited number of central generating facilities uh, with a reliable grid, it was relatively straightforward to balance sort of system supply and system demand. And that's becoming even more that's becoming more difficult now because of the variance on that renewable generation side. In time, there will be a value placed on your flexibility and whether or not you want to sell that into the grid. Someone will pay you for that. Okay, and the technology is there such that you can do that without adversely impacting your comfort levels. It's a complex area. It's very complex from a system perspective. But from a consumer perspective, all of the signals, all of the tools, they must be easy to use if we're looking for that level of engagement. It will, in turn, drive greater competition and more innovative products, more personalized products. What's important, we make sure that they are clear and easy to use. The profile that I showed you earlier that's been with us for quite some time. Uh, we do a lot of planning around that, port, around that profile. Okay? And it's the dearest time to generate electricity. It's the dearest time to distribute and transmit electricity at those peak times. Um, the aggregation of consumer load is based around profiles, based around diversity, that not everyone in this room has the same sort of usage patterns. So it allows and it gives us a bit of breathing space in our, uh, in our network's infrastructure. If all of this load is to be instantaneously switched on and switched off, switched on, switched off in line with a system operator request, it can introduce major complexities onto the system. And we're working very, very hard in trying to resolve those difficulties. So finally, looking forward, what will the energy system deliver you for you? A smarter system will have greater reliability and security of supply. Um, we already have Urban and excellent sort of reliability, continuity is excellent, but this will take us to a sort of a, a newer level. Energy cost savings to you as a consumer, a choice of services, and they're really tied hand in hand and will largely depend on, on the offerings. A reduced environmental impact. All of this, the amount of extra renewables onto the system is only going to be good for the environment. And finally, improved data and communications uh, internally and to the customers. Um, in, a, in, a, in a sentence, then, the smart system of the future will be more distributed. We'll have lots more. We'll have potentially hundreds of wind farms, thousands of microgeneration sites, thousands of EVs, thousands of storage sites. It will be integrated. So all of these devices will be included in how we plan, how we design, and how we operate the network. Be interactive with the customer. Open up a whole new realm of interaction that you haven't had before. And finally, it'll be self-healing. There'll be a level of intelligence in the network that will recognize when it's sick, what's causing the problem, how to rectify it, and will enact solutions to do that. And that, uh, I think, can only be a good thing for all consumers. So, thank you very much.